Welcome to Live Like an Acrobat. I'm your host, Shanae Stiletto, two-time world acrobatic gymnastics champion, USA Gymnastics Hall of Fame member, and Cirque artist. I am also an advocate for RAIN. On each episode of the Live Like an Acrobat podcast, I discuss acro handstanding in terms of training tips, coaching, and I explore circus and acrobatic gymnastics competitive life as I have lived it from past to current, and I theorize on what the future may bring in these fields. On each episode of the Live Like an Acrobat podcast, I will bring you insight through my own experiences, which are rooted in a perspective built on social justice advocacy and how these important issues continue to intersect between the circus arts and acrobatics competitive world at large. On each episode, I have the pleasure of discussing these various narratives with a variety of fascinating special guests. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of the Live Like an Acrobat podcast. Check out Circo.co, a new circus school online international platform where you can learn hand balancing with me and learn so many other circus disciplines from trained circ performers from all over the world. Please consider a donation to encourage the continuation and evolution of this podcast. The details of how to donate are located in the show notes. Please make sure to check out the circuspreneurblog.com for extended conversations and interactive content of each episode of the Live Like an Acrobat podcast. Check out my new vlog series, Think Like an Acrobat, which is available exclusively on Circus Talk as a pro series. It's offering pro tips to professionals within the circus arts industry. On the fourth episode of Think Like an Acrobat, out now exclusively on CircusTalk.com, I interview dating and relationship empowerment coach Erin Tillman, better known as the Dating Advice Girl, about how to speak for yourself when navigating intimacy and consent as a performing arts professional. Enjoy this sneak peek of episode four of Think Like an Acrobat. A lot of times I encounter that people aren't really being honest about them, about what, what's really going to make them happy. So there's this feeling of, I should be doing this, or this is the way they say you're supposed to date or be in a relationship. And who's they? Society, parents, friends, colleagues. Really, ultimately, though, it should be just what is going to make you happy. But within that... Have you seen The Crown? The Crown is a circus short film that follows a young black woman on her journey of self-discovery. On her quest, she encounters five archetypes to self-mastery. The film and virtual showcase hybrid features a stunning all-female cast of circus artists of African descent. The Crown was produced and directed by Veronica Blair and features performances by Summer Lacey, Copper Santiago, Shanae Stiletto, Susan Wojtyki, and Darielle Williams. It premiered this past Friday, February 19th, and the link to view The Crown is located in the show notes. On this episode of the Live Like an Acrobat podcast, celebrating the close of this year's Black History Month, I have the absolute pleasure of interviewing the sensational Whitney Houston performance artist, Akina Amici. Hailed as Whitney Houston's prettier sister who sings almost as good as her idol by German magazine Tip in July 1994, German Nigerian born Akena Amici has been fascinated with the iconic Whitney Houston since he spotted her on a catwalk in 1984. A passion ignited within Akena, and before he knew it, dazzling as a legendary songstress on the global entertainment stage became his true calling. Told that it was impossible to reach Whitney's voice range because of his deep voice, spurred a relentless regimen inside of Akena to perfect the five octave range that would produce the full realization of his embodiment of the voice herself. Akena sings live without exception, and her repertoire includes every song that Whitney Houston has ever done. He also writes, composes, and even works as a background singer for music studios. 
His work as backup for the group Fancy for the German countdown Grand Prix Eurovision in the year 2000 with the song We Can Move a Mountain is a career highlight having been viewed over 8 million times. Ekeno was featured in the live broadcast of the Gay Pride Meza Palomas du Gran Canaria, which was seen by over 30 million people in 84 countries worldwide. He has performed in the show of shows in Las Vegas from the Entertainment Network and has even appeared in a small role in the Hollywood movie Bamboo Shark. Akena Amici was a special guest in the sole production of All Night Long at the Winter Garden Variety in Berlin, Germany, and has, in most recent years, headlined her own open-air concerts as a Winter Garden headliner. Akena, as an international tribute sensation, has worked at a number of venues and event productions, such as the Grand Hyatt in Hong Kong, Easy Street Sunderland, Pan Am Lounge, Maritime Hotel in Dusseldorf, and Akena has also enjoyed a vibrant career in Bangkok, Thailand, where he calls his second home. One of the most notable experiences of Akena's career was when her photo as Whitney Houston was used by mistake on the Piers Morgan show on CNN during his interview with LL Cool J discussing the tragic passing of the star. Akena received global fame and recognition with the use of the photo, which circulated all over the world as the representation of the famed songstress. Akena Amici is the voice, presence, and true embodiment of the legacy of the starlet. Please welcome Akena Amici to the show. What can I say about Akina Amici and who he represents? We had a conversation that was so illuminating and engaging. I adore, I love, I behold Akina with such a joyful heart. I absolutely was enveloped in a deep, deep healing embrace by the wisdom translation of unimaginable happenings and rich insights that Akena came to reveal in this episode. Interviewing a professional songstress who is so masterful by the way she speaks was the delight of my life and there's almost not yet the language to describe the tenacity, the softness, the compassion, the exuberance and the riveting spirit of Ikenna and I was so privileged to perform with her at the Winter Garden a few years back in Berlin, Germany. We just enveloped each other in this conversation and I listened while being purified by his grace and intentionality of words as a performance artist who knows what she knows and that's a lot. <laughs> I think there's a special kind of bravery and courage reserved on earth for the likes of Akina Amici, though I won't say that her bravery was not hard won. The intuitive prowess of Akina is innate and admirable. He loves his heritage. She celebrates every element of who she is and in a way that would remind anyone to be proud of how they became who they are in this world while giving thanks to that unique mixture of souls that collaborated to help them become who they became. With an intellect as sharp as a knife, but as delicate as the soothing voice of Whitney Houston to help guide you through the complexity of the human condition as it exists throughout this world, Akina Amici is the artist artist. And if you are in the arts, you know exactly what I mean. And if you find yourself an enthusiast captivated by the aura of artists, this Conversation with Akina Amici, Whitney Houston tribute impersonator extraordinaire, will give you the insight into the humanity of those that bring forth the muses. So please welcome Akina Amici to the show.
Hello, Cindy. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm so happy to have you on the show. It's been so long. <laughs> yes, thank you for having me. It's really been long, a really, really long time. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is like an all night long reunion month for the podcast. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, um, oh yeah! I had Yanene on uh, earlier this wow. month. Yep, to yeah. speak about his career and his entertainment company, African Dream Circus, and now I have you on the show, Akana. <laughs> <laughs> Like I thought it would be perfect to have you on this month because all night long, uh, the variety that we did in Berlin at the in Berlin, Winter Garden. Oh yeah. Yes, yes. That was a special show. My goodness. Yes, it was. It was. It was so special. Like it was literally. It was. It was the first soul show that I ever did celebrating Black creatives. Like in my career. Yes. In, yes, yes, in yes. my in my whole life, like so, I I wanted to focus on that because, of course, this is like my first. Uh, this is my second season of my podcast, but this is the first. Time wow! I'm congratulations! Thank yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm 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 really loving it, and I'm really loving speaking about like my experiences in my career, and then bringing on the artists that I had these really big experiences with in my career all that right. were so impactful and that were so memorable and all night long um was mm. definitely one of those experiences it was like it was supposed to be it was really fun it was supposed to be an all-black cast right Akina? like it was <laughs> but it wasn't yeah and it wasn't but um you see the the beauty thing of it is uh we played the first um the first show all night long for i think five and a half months in a row and the people the people in berlin that were watching the show they were not really even aware of, oh, most of the artists on the stage are black because they don't really care. You know, the, the, the producer, the producer wasn't sitting there, Frank. Frank, he didn't say, oh, uh, we need only this. And we, he just felt we need this person, we need this person. And at the end of the day, they were almost black. And a lot of people from Africa, and I loved it. Yeah. But after years after it was there has never been a show like that here ever. Yeah, there wasn't. I mean, and there there hasn't been anywhere. I mean, and the, no. the, you know, and it the... just happened. <laughs> and it just <laughs> happened. It, it was just... not designed. You know, it was not designed of okay, let's put on a all black show or something. It was just the process of having the music first, looking uh, on which artist would fit which song. And that's how it came along. Beautiful. Oh, so beautiful. And you were everything as Whitney. Oh, thank you. Uh, you mm. know, as, <laughs> as, as the Miss Whitney Houston, Akina, you are, you were, <laughs> like, sensational. You did a whole concert um, in the show. <laughs> uh, for, for listeners, you know, it was a full variety show, but Akina did her entire set um as 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 a tribute um as as a as a as a performance artist who expresses who looks as the Whitney Houston I mean you're so gorgeous you're so beautiful oh god thank you so um, much you're you and know that was such yeah yeah that was such a big deal I mean at that time Ugh. when they asked me to be in the show even before they casted all the all the other artists the main thing that I really said I would love to do is because they said we are going to have a live band. <laughs> because I wasn't really thrilled about working in one theater five and a half months. <laughs> I've never done that before. And as a singer, it's different. So I've been doing like, you know, a month, then you rest a week, you do another month, that's something else. Mm. But when they said, uh, look at, when I saw the show coming together, who is on and how this show is going to be and what impact. And the funny thing is you have a Whitney Houston <laughs> female impersonator singing live with a live band. And that Whitney Houston is originally from Berlin. <gasps> you know, <laughs> that was something else. Everybody assumed, oh, 
Where did they get this lady? She must be from Vegas. She must be from New York. No, she's just from Berlin. <laughs> I love it. I love it when I, as, when you finish your song and then you break out into German and, and you yeah. start to speak to the audience because your entire set, you're very interactive and, you know, yes. you go back and forth <laughs> with the audience and you have such a lovely set. You have such a rapport with them and the, the, the emotions from the audience. It was every I know. time. We're I so know. consistent when you dropped in to speak and to say to <gasps> Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, she's German. <laughs> oh, that was said- such a blessing, such a blessing because I I mean it could have gone wrong too, you know? <laughs> yeah, sure. I know that I'm good. I know that I'm good. <laughs> but it's a show and if the show is sold, you better be good. <laughs> so, uh you just you just don't know what to expect. I knew it would the show would be a huge thing, but I knew that my my part of the show was a little different than the rest. So, you know, it took, um, I, I think I have to really say thank you to, um, to, to Wintergarten to really just say, we don't care about you being a guy doing a woman. We love you as you are, you are in the show anyway. Because that's something else, you know, in this kind of audiences, they're not used to having this mix of a regular um, artist show with having somebody like me mm-hmm. at the same time. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I, 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 I performed directly after you, so this was also yes. what is so special <laughs> about this. And like, I coming in as like a circus hand balancer, and I was like, how can I follow Whitney Houston? Like, who, <laughs> who follows Whitney Houston? Who can? Who can? Like, I, you know, and, and my brother was there. Do you remember? Do you remember when my brother? Yes, came? of course, <laughs> of course, of course. He loved you. I was telling him the other day that I was going to have you on the show, and he was like, wow. Oh. Oh. Well, he Say said, hi he to said, him. He said to tell you hello. <laughs> <laughs> Say hello to him. <laughs> he loved you, but he, we were talking about it because we were we were laughing every single time when I was doing the show. I was just like, you know, I tell my brother Marquis. I was like, Marquis. He was like, yeah, I know. He was like, and can I is Whitney? <laughs> you have to go after the most iconic like singer on the planet <laughs> and, and you know and I have to I have to perform with my you know my 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 simple my little variety have circus hand balancing special um I did my best <laughs> simple I said, did you say simple yes did you I, say simple when, when you perform after an icon a legend a kenna <laughs> With you bringing Whitney every night, then you become simple. I <laughs> listen, listen, see, there is let, let, let me just put it that way. There was a reason why they put you behind me because even after that kind of show, you need somebody that can take it and you could take it. Oof. Oof. Well, you did Oof. every night, every night, you know. I had to find so? something inside of myself. It really pushed me, really. I had to I had to find a new level of performance in myself. It was really it was a really good challenge. It really was. I had to um I had to find more personality. I had to find more character. I really had to <laughs> express myself in an, a com- in a totally new way. It was good and I felt it like literally every single night. You know, I did. It didn't I didn't feel like I coasted on that one because like I said, you, you, you were on stage, you held the stage for a very long time, you know, and you know, yes, with, the, with over the circus 20 minutes, per- over 20 minutes, mm-hmm. you know, with circus performers, we kind of hit it and quit it. You know, we get our five yeah. and seven yeah. minutes and that's it. Like we have to make our impact fast and with you making an impact over like such a long amount of time. And I have to tell the, the, the listeners right now, you know, I kind of like, mm-hmm. is like, you know, the people would just, I mean, they were just pulled over. They just loved you after the show. I mean, with the audience and seeing how much they loved you. Oh my gosh. They just, 
they were captivated um, by, by you. Oh, thank and I have, you so much. And I have to say too, you know, like you said, thank you to Winter Garden. I love Winter Garden. I love the shows that they do. Again, yes, progressive yes, yes. and open and and evolved. And and also too, began like that was a really big deal. And now it's becoming something in circus where yeah. on the castings they ask for a drag artist specifically or for exactly. a impersonator and this is mm -hmm. happening now in the last couple of years and you know so it's 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 happened now of course like you said when you first did that it was it was incredibly unique and more fringe i would say to have that in a variety show and now when yeah. i see the castings i'm like and how about that now it's actually an a request for, you see? For, for someone doing drag, for someone to do impersonations, which I have to say, you know, obviously you impersonate because, you know, you don't lip sing. You you are exactly. a singer. You use your own yeah. voice, which is also a very unique take on, on yeah. the performance <laughs> art that you do. I mean, you take on yeah. Whitney Houston's music, too. I mean, you know, that's also, too, a courage. <laughs> Oh and, yeah, <laughs> an artistic bravery that you have. Bravery, thank you. Taking thank you. Bravery, on exactly. Whitney Houston's music. I mean, and also to you, just like with your look and with your style. I want to also tell the listeners, like, Akena has the most amazing natural nails um, <laughs> that I had ever yeah. seen. I, I, I am not. I am not that kind of lady. Um, I have never been. I, I would hope to be one day to have. <laughs> <laughs> to have to have the beauty of the nails but you you know you have you have everything you know you know the, the the just the look you know the figure the voice the everything and I mean like how is that you know I wanted to I also want to say you know like we're celebrating the closing of Black History Month in America yes and yeah. um you know and you know I thought I thought again what better to honor you know, an iconic Black artist like Whitney Houston, with like you do oh, wow. with your performances, um, keeping her music alive because you keep her magic oh, alive. Oh, God, yeah. You know, with your, with oh, your, my with God. your performance yeah. art. And, you know, you take so many you take people to so many places because people, you know, loved her all over the world. And so your presence, how you look like her is so powerful. And, you know, I just, I thought it was kind of like, you know, like full circle, you know, especially with us having so much experience about her now and who she really exactly. was, you know, yeah, as yeah, like yeah. the full realized person that in some ways she not, didn't really get to live that, you know, like, no, she, she didn't, she didn't. There was, there was so yeah. much struggle in her experience and she didn't have like the Free, the same freedom the same level of freedom so you know like what I wanted to ask you like it kind of like what has been your journey you know to to imbibing like the essence of Whitney Houston what do you think about Whitney Houston and what has been like your artistic journey and in mm -hmm in finding um, your path to expressing her and to impersonating her and in coming into, you know, your own as, as, as a singer, like, you know, like how did you start um, as a performance artist? And then like, what was the thing that kind of was the tipping point where, you know, the, the witness became what you decided to like, okay. express continuously. Okay. Yeah. Let's go back to the good word you put in bravery. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, it should be your middle name. I can't have brave. Exactly, bravery. <laughs> exactly. When when I was a young teenager, um, Whitney Houston was just it for me. Like for many other people, but at that time I didn't know that she was new. I heard her music. I heard her um, her voice. And um, I love Motown, I love black music, up and down, jazz, everything. Whitney Houston changed the game for me. Now I know she changed the game for everyone, but at that time it was just, she changed everything in my head. So when I went to my first, um, I wouldn't even say uh, Christopher Street Day, something like that in Berlin, you know, put on a little makeup the first time as a teenager, um i noticed that i could pull off her look that's what i thought at that time bear with me i was young bravery you're very brave when you're young you know you think <laughs> you you just know everything the youth i didn't 
Yeah, I didn't really like um, heavy makeup. I was feminine anyway. So I, at that time, I had a little problem with it. When I was young, everybody thought, thought I was a girl. And in school time, that was not funny if you get bullied from the boys because you look like a girl. That's a different thing. So when I put on some makeup and I had her big poster near my, um, near my wall and I tried to use the same colors, the same eyebrows and everything, it was my own mother that said just before I went out of the apartment, oh my goodness, you just look like Whitney Houston. And I laughed at, I was like, oh, thank you, mom. See you later, I'm going to party, you know? So um, I started doing that. We went on at that time, um, when we went to parties, we put on some makeup. It was just, it was just normal in the gay scene. So I started to really, try to to catch that look so my skin color was similar my height was similar the body was similar the smile was similar so there were there were a few things that just came naturally oh we know where that comes from because i know i am we are every woman that's why <laughs> I <have to> say. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> And I was not even interested. Uh, I was not even interested in, in you know, doing drag. And I'm not saying it negatively. Doing drag, in my understanding, is like you want to captivate something. And what I was doing, I was just polishing something that was already there. Mm. That's what was in my mind. You know, I thought of myself. Okay, you have the Whitney Houston look. You love her. You just like the, you know, she was always close up. Others were showing their boobs. She was close up. She was a lady, like her cousin Dionne Warwick in that kind of setting. I loved that. Even as a child, I loved it. So that's how I started um, really getting that look. And immediately other people were calling me Whitney Houston. So even, even be, way before, even way before I did it as a job, which I never thought I would do. I was in sports when I was a teenager. So they already called me Whitney at an early age. And I say, I didn't hate it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. What, what, sport, what sports were you doing when you were young? Well, I did, um, I was in running. Um, how do, um, in German, we say Hochsprung, jumping over the, I don't know. Do you call it high jump? No, I'm sure it's yes. right. Is it right? Yes. Something tells me it sounds wrong. <laughs> it was running, it was running, swimming, a high jump, and something else. But very early, I think when I was in, in almost finished with school, I had a problem with my knee. So the doctor said, uh, doesn't look like you're going to have a long career in, in, in sports. And at the same time, the only thing I really learned was dancing. I was in dance schools. So you know, dancing with a knee that is painful wasn't the good ticket at that time. So my first big dreams already crashed before I was grown up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was a bitter pill somehow. So it was making the way. That's why it was like, you know, possible, we've got, possible. We've got different, different, different plans for you. Because I was also I was thinking about that in terms I was going to ask you if you had done dance because I was thinking about you in terms of ballet, um, because, uh -huh. you, you know, you've I got... was the only guy I asked. Oh. Uh, I was just in it was not nothing really serious. You know, mm -hmm. I tried to I, uh, I went to different classes. I was doing ballet. I was. At that time, they called the other dance jazz dance. I don't know if they still call it that way. <laughs> you know, what, what people were dancing in the music videos at that time. That's something I wanted to become behind Janet Jackson, behind Michael Jackson, all that kind of dancing. I loved it. And I went to schooling for that. Mm. Oh. So even in ballet, I said, uh, I want to have the shoes so that I can dance on my tips. <laughs> at that time, yeah, the teacher didn't think it's funny but it was something I really wanted to learn as a boy I, I didn't say I want to become a ballerina I just want to know how to achieve that skill you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So he didn't allow me. So I did it with the ballerinas in my private time till I got to know how to do a perfect period on that toe. Wow. I lost, you know, I lost interest a few years later, (laughs) but I knew how to do it. I knew how to do it. So if you, yeah, if you start dancing on your toes, for me, it was very easy to dance on high heels later. That was no big deal. (laughs) You know, (laughs) so high heels are really natural for me. That's something I always say uh, you're born to be on high heels or not. It's true. Sorry. It's true. Sorry. It's true. You can learn as long as you want. You're born (laughs) or not. You know? Exactly. I mean, like being on releve either comes to you naturally or it exactly. just it just does not. I mean, like for me, being in stilettos, being in high heels yes. is like breathing. And I mean, again, too, again, the way that you move around the stage and the way that you <laughs> run in your high heels. I mean, mm. that again, that's a different, you know, that's a that's a completely different thing. Like, and you're so right. I tell people that too. They always people always ask me that if they see me in my stilettos, they say, "How much training do?" Did you yes, have exactly. you know, like working in your like your stilettos, your high heels, and I'm like none. <laughs> exactly, you you put them on and you're on. <laughs> <laughs> and you're on. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so amazing! I love that you taught yourself. I also wanted to pivot back because you know, because you know I grew up as a sportsman, so anybody that had like any kind of path, obviously like in sports, yes. is always very interesting to me because I love it. I'm a sportsman at heart. That was you know my first love. That's how I. Yes. A circus performer. I always have so many questions about that. I'd love to see if people like got some of their craft out of their sport. Um, like I did, um, you know, being mm-hmm. able to turn it into their craft, which is interesting that you did just in, in really interesting, unique ways. I love that. But like, it actually did come from that. So like that, that like, yes, makes, like, it a did. Lot of sense. It did. Yeah. 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 So even when I was in a lower class, they tried, um, we had a program in, in Germany. It called, it was called, um, if I translate it real quick, um, like youth is preparing for Olympia, something like that. So that was a school program. So because just to check out your talent. So they put me in a sports class, but everybody was like three, four years older than me, which was even, more frightening and the <laughs> bullying was even much more because they were older so you this skinny not black not white feminine boy jumps higher than you runs faster than you so whenever i did that i got a punch in the face afterward because i really embarrassed them they were three four years older than me but i didn't i i um that school taught me that okay, I love sports, I have talent, but I was sure that I'm not going to do this kind of training like seven or eight hours a day. The swimming I love, it killed me. Just swimming like a fish, right, left, right. People, I know people that can do that for hours. I can't, (laughs) you know? So you don't, it's not only the talent you need, you really need to have that fight. You need to have that craving and, um, well, something not right in your brain to really do it <laughs> like uh, yeah. I do on stage you know exactly. nothing will ever pull me from a stage ever <laughs> you know no, it so was that like... was okay, you were saying continue please continue <laughs> <laughs> so at that early age I think I was very thankful to have that experience because I um first of all I had this knee that was really horrible and I think it was from my from the jumping at an early age I was really jumping a lot not in the right way how you would say today today you will have a teacher he would tell you on a on a monitor jump like this do this and that I was just going and jumping jumping wherever I could (laughs) so I'm sure that was maybe one jump too much (laughs) and the dancing and the sports got in the way of each other when I danced more I was too you know, too gummy for the sports. And when I had more sports, I was too stiff for the dancing. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense somehow, Mm -hmm. you know, as, Mm -hmm. as a guy to really like, oh, nobody should get me wrong for dancing too, 
you know, open the legs <laughs> for the dancing. <laughs> I just had to say that before that. If you do sports, it is really, it's really, really hard. I know some girls have it easier. The girls in my class, they could bend like nobody's business. I couldn't. My legs were too strong already from the sports. And I had problems on, on both sides, on the dancing side, on the sports side, then with the knee. It was over then before I turned 18. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I can I can understand that. I've I've I've, mm. I've heard uh, similar like revelations. And going back to you being a part of like that kind of like on the track to Olympia. Like I have a I I'm thinking about also too in terms of like you know your experiences like with Whitney and when you were young. Yeah. And I had an experience as a sportsman with Whitney that was mm -hmm. really powerful <gasps> and profound too. Wow. Like I I was um there was this big video that they would make kind of like at the end of the com competitive year. Um, and like if you were like special you made it into yeah. this video but it was like acrobats and gymnasts wow. from like all over america and they i made a, i made it into the video a little bit like very very tiny i was very very young i was like seven or eight years old but my parents bought me this video wow and the ending song for this video was one moment in time by Whitney oh, Houston, goodness. and it was like the best of the best of the sportsmen, like in acrobatics mm -hmm. and gymnastics, were in that section. <laughs> oh and, my goodness! And I watched wow. it. I, I must have watched it like thousands of times. Um, yeah, and that's how I became. Like that's how I, I discovered. Whitney and discovered her music and it was like mm -hmm. this is like my I watched it with my brothers and sisters and we like yeah it was like everything it was like everything that I used to like move forward and like to want to be yeah. better and yeah to want to yes. be like an acrobat so it's like yeah it has such like meaning for me like especially like you know like you know hearing you sing like one moment in time and it's just it's just one of those songs that takes me back to really like um really important periods in our life that are very defining right like you know we have those experiences definitely in our life that they, they, they send us you know down down a certain path and so I wanted to like ask you too Kenneth so when you decided and you made that decision like okay this is what I can do this is who I want to be this is how I want to live like turning your craft and making that into you know your business because you work all over the world you perform all over the world but what yes. I also love about you too is that you're so beloved in Germany and you 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 have such a an audience there um but you know being international and working all over the place and obviously expressing yourself as an impersonator like when did you like decide that and what was it like getting those commitments and getting those jobs mm. and finding mm -mm -mm -mm. like what circuits would work for you. And then just kind of like, I don't know, creating like your own niche, you know, um, yeah. for example, like I always tell everybody now, like several things that they see, it's like, okay, it's, it's commonplace now. Like you're even talking about drag, you know, like now they have like RuPaul's I drag know. race and mm -hmm. that's like everywhere. And so now everybody can expect, they expect a, exactly. a certain, a certain, a certain level or a certain quality, um, you know, of, of drag queens now, which, you know, it wasn't like that, you know, just even like a few years ago, but it's, it's very much made everything mainstream. Um, and so like, but what was it like when you started performing and like what were your experiences mm -hmm. like performing you know in these different in these different environments in these different countries mm -hmm. um as 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 a Whitney Houston impersonator and and how did you like make your way as mm -hmm. a working artist well um at that time as you just say uh, there's so many things you can just have access to today at that time I was just young I came out of school and um, I knew I wanted to be on stage badly, but I had no clue. I had no tools. I had nobody that knew anything. So while I was perfecting my look on parties and everything, somebody offered me a job to do a, a Whitney Houston tribute show, which, I mean, that was something I, uh, I was in shock at the moment because I was looking for this kind of um, opportunity, but I had no clue. There was no internet. There was nothing like that. Yes, I'm that old. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I did that one show 
and it was horrifying in a way because I knew you really have to deliver right now. And for that time, I don't know how old I was. I think, yeah, I think I was 20, some, yeah, I, I guess, just 19 or 20. Already trying to really look for something. I had, even now, I didn't even know we have, we had drag clubs in Berlin at that time. I was a teenager. We went to teenage discotheques or something like that. So there was no, no access and I had nobody that knew anything about that. So one day there was a there was a pub on Kudam, one of the main um, um, shopping streets in Berlin, and on a Monday they had something that was very new at that time, karaoke. So I went there. I asked them because even at that time you didn't have playbacks or something like that, you know, backing tracks or so. So it was a very different time. You had no access of getting backing track music for the songs you liked. It was very new. You could import them from New York. Pocket songs, they were called. You know, you got, um, then you got the CD sent three, four weeks later, if at all. So I went and asked them, do you have a song from Whitney Houston? And at that, on that day, they said no. So my first song that I did live was even a song from Anita Baker, Sweet Love. I went on that stage. <laughs> I must have been crazy. I can't I can believe it if I think about it now. And I just sang that song, closed my eyes, sang that song, felt very, very, I had a film behind my eyes just rolling. <laughs> and um, well, I sang it in a female key, of course, which was normal to me. Don't ask me how I do it. It's just the way I sing. So the people were shocked after that. But at the beginning, I didn't know where they shocked because they liked me or they didn't like me. So I got applause and um, uh, they, they were really cheering. And that was such a strange thing because that was the first time I ever stood on a stage as a boy even singing a girl song. So the manager ran up to me afterwards and told me I have to come every week and I'll get free drinks. That was my first, <laughs> that was my first. So it wasn't like a gig, but I was, I, I said, oh God, the manager, he even knows me. He took notice of me. And after a few weeks, you had the same people coming every week. You know, people that were trying to to, to get in the business, trying to be heard and all that. So you started connecting with this kind of young people. And that's where I got somebody that heard me. And that's when I had my first and only, how you call it now, casting at a record company. I don't want to drop some names now, but I went to the only casting for a record company, went into the bureau, they asked me to sing two songs. I did, I have nothing and I'm every woman, brave. I mean, today I would, you know, once you're an adult, you'll be so nervous that your vocal cords will not perform. So at that age, I said, I didn't know who these people were, world renowned um, producers, you know? And I was sitting in the bureau of Frank Farian who did Bonnie M and, this group in Europe that I loved no. as a child <gasps> and he did so many other things you know <gasps> and I had the nerve to me I had the nerve to go into that bureau it was summer the window was open and I, the first thing I said to him <laughs> was uh, could you please close the window because I sing very loud I can't believe to this day that I really said that and I was not nervous at all Great. So he, oh God, how embarrassing to this kind of people. So he just quickly said, uh, he went, closed the window, said, start singing. That's, that's what, it, that was it. On the same day, I thought they, they said, we'll get back to you. On the same day, they offered me a contract. The same day. No. So that wasn't even a big deal because, you know, I didn't work for it. It's strange to explain that now, you know? Mm -hmm. I was already on my, 
on my path of doing Whitney Houston and drag. So I spoke with these producers. I said, listen, I'm not really interested in putting me into a one boy boy band. That's, that's what they were planning with me. And even at that time, they were trying to tell me, we love your, and, um, your feminine look, but uh, we have to make sure you don't really spill that you're gay. If you are gay, they didn't even ask me if I am gay. They just try to let me know if this will not work for the business. So hmm. I had two weeks to decide. And today I think I would be a wreck. At that time, it was very easy. I, my stomach told me, no, that's not for you. Build your own thing small by small. How we say in Nigeria, small by small. <laughs> <laughs> You know, just work into your own, get to know the, get to know what you have to do. Because this was really frightening. You had all these people around you deciding for you. They already told me what kind of tux I'm going to wear, contact lens, um, because they were trying. I don't know if you remember that group, Milli Vanilli. Yes! <sighs> I'm honest. That's why I can say it, because I have proof of that. I was their replacement. <gasps> So at that time, yes, at that time, uh, when Milli Vanilli was done, they were already looking for something to keep that, um, that name going. So they were not even looking for two people to, uh, to, to um, replace them. But I have some similarities to the lead singer. You know, he was, he, he almost mm. looked, we looked like brothers. At that mm. time, I had braids. He had, uh, I think, blue eyes. I have brown eyes. That's why they came up with the contact lenses. Oh my God. So I already saw that shock. I mean, they were just puppets. They had no fun. You know, everything was done for them. And that's why the whole thing didn't work. So I knew that I would just, I, I might have a job. But at the same time, I knew I would have no possibility on my own to get out of that once I don't want to be in there anymore and pretending of being straight and all that you know I just came out of school school being gay is not easy um, as a teenager being gay is not easy anyway even in Berlin it's not so I said no I think I'm already too proud to pretend why should I pretend there's no reason for that so in this two weeks I said no and I then that was a goal for me because I said, if a, um, Hansa records are linked to Arisa records, that's what, what they told me, you would be in the same record company as Whitney Houston. <laughs> 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 oh my God. Here you see, somebody tells you that when you're 19 or something, it, it's just like, where can I sign? Where can I sign? You know, it's the first thought. But then I knew, no, you will not get out of that uh you will not you will never get out of that the music style i like milli vanilli but that that wasn't something i was looking for at that time so i did it on my own and that casting gave me gave me a very big boost because i thought if people of this caliber give me or are willing to give me a contract on the same day i must be good but I don't need them. You so are I, fabulous. So I, that's why I, um, even to today, I have worked with many managers. I never had an agent. I never had a manager. I have some people like managing things abroad. You can't be everywhere at the same time. You know, in the UK, I have somebody, my friend John Barry, who is in uh, the music industry for like forever. You know, I do all the, the, the gay prides in the UK. Okay, last year we didn't. <laughs> and it doesn't look like this year. And the pride thing is another very important thing for me. The prides that I do worldwide are not for the money. This is just like awareness. A few years back, people were saying, oh, do we still need prides? Because everything was, you know, looking good in a few countries. Mm. But since I come around a lot... Mm -hmm. And should I mention, should I mention, um, I'm a Nigerian, mm. 
just to clear that up quickly, I was, my mom, my mother is German mm -hmm. and my father is Nigerian. I was born in Berlin, but I grew up in Nigeria. So I know the feeling of being in a black, no, a black country wouldn't come up good now. You know what I mean? In a country where like 98% are African black people. Mm -hmm. I was just one of them. Mm -hmm. That was a normal life for me. My grandma is black. My father is black. My president was black. My teacher, everything was black. <laughs> so I had this kind of life, which is very important. Yeah. What you what you don't have if you are black living in a white society. Mm -hmm. So while I was in Nigeria, I was living in a black society, which is a very it's a different universe. Nigeria has its problems, no doubt, especially on the gay issues and everything. But having having my childhood in Nigeria, surrounded by my black family. That's why nobody here can tell me, oh, you're mixed. Oh, you, are you this or that? I'm in Nigeria and I'm black. What's your problem? You know, I have the confidence to say that. <laughs> I have a Nigerian passport too now. I have a German one. I have a Nigerian one. I'm the lead in my Nigerian family because I'm the first son of my father. These mechanisms are still working there. So there's nobody that can tell me or ask me, how black are you? or are you black or are you this or that? So that's why when you come from Africa into a white society, mm -hmm. back to Germany, mm -hmm. your view is completely different. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I wouldn't even say it's a view, it was a shock, of course. Hmm. Although I was born here, but when we left, I was really small. So I couldn't really remember. I had to learn German new and everything. How old were you so, when you came back to Germany? Like full time. Well, I came. We came back. I had to repeat school because I. It was a. It, I mean, school wise, of course, it's a mess. If you come back when you're around twelve, twelve-ish, I guess. Wow. So you're just middle in your school, you know. Wow. And it, it's it's because you have a different school system the school system in Nigeria is good it's really good so even when I was in class two or class three in Nigeria mm -hmm. we were aware about um about slavery about um what the UK or Great Britain did to Africa and blah 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 and all these kind of things this was just common knowledge which was very interesting when I came here it wasn't it wasn't to be found anywhere in the school system <laughs> to much, much later, you know, much later in, in an art of a story. So gathering all these kind of different things together is really no joke somehow, you know? Yeah. I mean... So I, so I don't know how I got here now. We were still, I, I don't know how I came from, <laughs> you know, nearly signing a wonderful wonderful contract <laughs> with Hansa Records uh, slash Arista Records to going to Nigeria real quick and come back. <laughs> it was perfect. It was perfect. I mean, like, I was going to ask you even more about, about, about background, okay. about all of that. And yeah. that was, the, that was the perfect segue. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. You, because you, it. Yeah. you see, I'm always used to like when I, um, people don't, I know how I listen to other people sometimes. So when, when I talk about I am this or I am that, I just try to make it clear at that point before people start thinking, what does she mean she is this or she is that? You see, even I say she, because I don't care. I'm a guy, my job is being a female singer. So I'm used to it. And since my name Ikena ends with an A, Whenever I get, uh, that's really a funny thing in Germany, because, you know, let all these letters that get out automatically, they usually put Mrs. Ikena because Ikena sounds like a female name here. <laughs> so my whole life, I was fighting against it when I was small, because that wasn't funny when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Ikena Amiti, I'm a boy, what are you writing? <laughs> they just assume, they just assume Ikena is a female, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in Nigeria, it's a typical boy name. 
Mm. You know, yes, Mm. it's a male name. It's not a female name. Yes. I didn't know that, that it was a typical, yeah. it's, uh, that it was typical. I mean. Yeah, it's typical. It's not like, it's not like, an, it's not a name like Frank or, 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 or John that often, but it's a, in, in, in the tribe, it sounds funny maybe, but the tribe I come from, we are the Igbos in our uh, Igbo You're language. Igbo. Oh, you speak yes. Igbo. Oh my gosh. Not I much teaching. anymore. Oh my gosh. I <laughs> not mean, much. He, you you know I mean of course everybody is anybody who anyone knows like the 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 queen of the modern uh, uh, feminist um, yeah you know uh, how much how much we love her you know that's of course that's why I know I know about Igbo. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so every Igbo hears Ikena knows okay that's a guy that's where confusion starts in Nigeria when they see my picture as a woman. And see the name Ikena Amich because they can really track me down to the village. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, wait a second. So, do you do you, have you performed a lot in Nigeria? Um, Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> Impossible. Not possible. Oh, you must be out of your mind to even think about trying to do that. Because that's that that's that's a big question for me that I had as soon yes. as you started speaking about that. What is that experience like? And I mean, with the with the laws there, um, with see, I yeah, yeah um, so never okay. I don't I don't want to put the whole uh, family thing into this because that's really too long. But let me just say this: when uh, we came back to Germany, it was just me, my brother, and my mom. My, my German mom, because uh, my parents got separated. That's why my mom took me and my brother out of the country, because the consequences were me and my brother have Nigerian passports. And when you get a d- divorce in Nigeria, my mother is a German. She can leave, but she cannot take her kids. So kudos to mm. a lioness. People mm. might argue, how can she do that? That, that is exactly what I would expect of a mother. Take care of your kids. She was brave early enough without anybody knowing she took us out of the country. So just a short note on that one. So I went back to Nigeria to visit my father. Uh, I think it was in two, uh, 2020. 13, I guess. It was something after, yeah, after all night long. After all night long for the first time. So a lot of things changed. I know West Africa is a very homophobic place, Nigeria in particular. And in that year when I was there to, you know, get back to my family, I mean, we were in contact loosely over the phone and texting and all that. I just had to be there to see my old father who is living in Nigeria in, in the village. So it was really strange in the same year when this horrible ant- anti-gay law came into place, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So I, that's why I rushed back to Nigeria just before it got signed. Wow. For me, myself, I wasn't really at risk at that, at that time because um, nobody really put Ikena Amechi with the Ikena Amici that went through the border, you know? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that thing blew up when Whitney Houston, um, Whitney Houston died in, in February. Just, yeah, just, the, just 2012. So we had her death day just a few days ago. I remember that. So when CNN, when CNN was speaking about Whitney Houston's dad, uh, Whitney Houston's death with LL Cool J, when my picture popped up in the back, which was kind of funny at that time. It did? You know? Yes. Piers oh Morgan, God. yes. Piers Morgan had a show on CNN. I remember. And he was... And he was interviewing Shaka Khan. That's why I was watching these shows. 
So since I'm at that time, I was already in Bangkok. So we had a time difference. I had to record the shows so that, so that I can see them. So on that particular show with LL Cool J talking about Whitney Houston, how he was friends with her and all that, my picture came up in the back. <gasps> so, so can you imagine how that felt when I saw that? Because it didn't click at first. I rewinded it and said, something's off here. I said, was that my picture or is it her? So I was really confused because there was no doubt CNN is not going to make a mistake like that. <laughs> and it was taken from a show I did in Las Vegas. <gasps> so I asked some people, I said, how is that possible? The same night I got a call from The Sun UK, an interview about that mistake, and they blew it up, which at that time I still thought it was funny. So some tab, then it got to TMZ and TMZ made a big mess out of it, of course. Whitney Houston, we have a problem. Whitney Houston has a dick. That was the headline. <gasps> Just like that. Oh I was still, yes. At that time, I, was, I wasn't laughing because, I mean, Whitney Houston was just dead and I was crying. I, I was out of my mind at that time. Mm. So why, I'm, why, why, am I say, why am I telling you this is the Nigeria media picked that up. They just, they, they just saw two things. A guy in a frock and the name Ikena Amechi. So they wanted to know who is who the hell is using a Nigerian name for this kind of gay blah 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 thing so some people that tried to get fame did interviews in Nigeria girls that were like 15 years younger than me they were just saying yes we went to school with Ikena before she had sex change and all this kind of funny things yes and people yes and they just it was I was reading it I was like they're talking about, they don't know me. They have, they don't even know that I'm not even in Nigeria for so many. I mean, I left Nigeria before that girl was born. So how can she say she went to school with me before I had sex change? Because they assume I'm a girl and now CNN outed me. So I'm a transgender, which I'm not either. Oh my God. So, Yes, this sounds funny, but at that time, that was the closed door for Nigeria. I got oh. threat mails. I got people that wrote me, we are waiting with gasoline at the airport. We will burn you <gasps> as soon as you get back to the country. Oh, my God. So I'm happy that my, my dad is in the village. He, had, he didn't really have access to all this kind of media stuff. And all my cousins were too small at that time with, um, with Facebook and, and Instagram and all that. So they didn't, they didn't follow all that. I mean, they know about it now. So I had to really save uh, my father in a way because this, this uh, gay bill says, if you're gay, you can get to prison for, you can go up to 14 years into prison including people that support you or that know about you, yes, that know about you and don't report. So that's why um, I knew I have to step back, <laughs> not be around my father in case somebody knows about me and tries to harm the family. So that's a very tricky thing because other family members are still, the last years were asking, ah, oh, Ikena, you're not coming back. I was there twice in 2012, 2013, uh, because I knew one year later it would be a big risk, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, could, I, could, I could get into the airport. I mean, the guy that is taking my passport doesn't know that I'm a female singer, you know? Mm -hmm. But as soon as the people maybe in my village know about it, um, you know, people start talking. And one thing, of course, you have this typical, this typical cliche. Ah, of course he's gay. He's having a dress on, which are two different things. I just, I, 
there is no problem with people having, you know, having sex in a dress or something. I'm just clarifying. I am not a transsexual. I'm a guy. Mm -hmm. And I don't have I don't have sexual feeling when I'm in a dress. When I'm in a dress, I'm a diva. I want to, you know, I want to make your jaw drop to say, oh my goodness, how gorgeous is she? That's what I work for, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. And, and that's what you radiate. <laughs> yes. Exactly. And that's something on a light side, you know, it's, it's something light. Mm -hmm. And other people try to make it a very nasty thing. I mean, it, that's why mm -hmm. I'm, I may, I didn't say it right. Just for them to put me in a bad thing, they had to put in the nasty anti-gay Christianity of it. I mean, Nigerian Chris, Christianity is an, a whole other subject. I was speaking with my family while I was there. That's really difficult because you see, if you don't have common ground, it's very difficult to, to have a dialogue on certain things. Mm -hmm. So I'm not bashing anybody with beliefs, but the way they believe. And religion and customs are two different things. And they are so melted in Nigeria from what they learned in the, from the, from the British crown in the 40s and the 50s. And it's still there today. So I was shocked while I was there because I knew, okay, if you want to have a conversation with, with certain things, with certain people, it's not possible. So as negative it sounds, I think I've lost the old people. I'm trying to get back on track with the new generation. Mm. The new generation... I expect more of them because they are younger. Mm -hmm. They are in the internet. They see how other parts of the world look like. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of people in Nigeria that are contacting me who are in the closet, of course, for assistance or help, which I love to do with, with what I can do. At the moment, it's uh, mostly advice and what they should do and what they shouldn't do. If they're like, you know, 20 or 21, mm -hmm. 20, 21 for me, it's a kid, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and growing up in, a, in an area where everybody tells you being gay is the devil, having sex with uh, the uh, same sex is devil and it's horrible and this and that. And they kick out their own kids out of their homes, mm -hmm. oh, uh, you know, all this, all, all this kind of thing. So it's really, mm -hmm. it's, it's really strange. I have the homophobic, the homophobic thing in Nigeria and had the, the, the racist thing in Germany. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a flip, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a flip side because while I was in Nigeria, there was nothing like, I mean, I don't want, I'm just speaking for myself before somebody says, oh, he's acting like Africans are not racist. I didn't say that. I'm just saying what I experienced in my own life, mm -hmm. that my mother is German. So when we were in Nigeria, of course, they knew my mother is a white woman. And in the village we lived, she was, the, I think there were like five or eight white people at all. Of course, for the people, it was different because they've never seen white people at that time. But they were not shutting their doors, you know. Mm -hmm. They assumed, they always assumed, oh, white people, the heart is delicate. So they started rubbing my mother with mosquito oil and, um, you know, thinking, oh, she's white. She is not meant to be here. So let's help her extra. <laughs> we got extra help. She got extra help. And mm -hmm. since my mother knew how it how difficult it was in Germany because she got married. Yes, she got married with my father in Germany. Mm -hmm. And no, he didn't shop for a passport. I'm trying to be funny. <laughs> he didn't shop for that. <laughs> he met my father and he was a student in medicine. So he was here already. I just want people to know that. He was here already. He did not need a passport. <laughs> So she already knew how it was to be in Germany with a black man. 
So when she came to Africa and saw the opposite, everybody was helping her mm. to get to fit into the life, to the customs and everything. She was overwhelmed. Mm. And I was overwhelmed too, because that's how it should be. And even now, sometimes I think if I look back, because of course I grew up now in Germany, so there's a kind of bitterness in the back, you know, on the racial thing. Mm -hmm. I sometimes think, oh my goodness, my old grandmother in Nigeria, how could she be so helpful to white people while everything she had was taken from her in the past? You know, how can you still be open uh, to a race that is really has really made fucked up Africa. Let's just put it, I don't know how to, you know, circle around yes. it. I don't want to circle around it. You it don't just have fucked to. it up. Exactly. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I thought later, if my grandmother can do that and my father who is living back in Africa could do that, I can do that too, you know? And I'm not really walking in their shoes because for me, it was, of course, it was, it was much easier on a different level mm -hmm. because I know how it feels like having an African president while you're living in Africa as a black boy, <laughs> not having, you know, and watching wow. uh, Africa. I mean, we watch Hollywood films too, but of course, even back in the day, we had uh, African soap operas. So the beautiful woman I knew were black the beautiful men I saw were black. So that was normal to me because I was not living in a white environment. Mm -hmm. So having both worlds is very, very important. So that's why I even encourage every, every, every black person or mixed person or whatever, if you have the opportunity to go to West Africa, do it just for the feel of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Of course, it's a different universe. Of course, it's a different universe and not every country is, is, is the same. But it, um, it answers, just by going there, it answers you so many questions that you didn't even ask. Oh, that's so beautiful. You know? Yeah. That's so, so beautiful. And it reminds me too of what you keep saying of people saying, why do we need certain things? And I always tell people, well, when you have gotten used to things out of privilege, you forget yes. how big yes. the world is. And exactly. it's like not until everybody wins, no one is fully winning. <laughs> So exactly. for exactly. pride, for example, and then for the conversations and the topics in and around race, I mean, like what you said, they're so multidimensional and so multifaceted and we all have so many interesting and different experiences with them. We all do. Yes. And so yeah. that's why these things are still so important because not everybody has that same level of freedom. And I'm so grateful. No to be in the yes. world like you've been a kind of like your whole life and traveling to all these countries and seeing all of the different levels of inequality mm -hmm. and seeing where people still can go to prison for something and you know that their life can be taken away and that it will impact your family family your family's family i mean these are yes. really real things so for me it's like that's what I think the best education is of being in the world. It makes me sad this last year, you know, we weren't able to travel, but I've had, you know, yes. like decades worth of travel because I've been traveling all over the world since I was really little. Mm -hmm. And it just shapes your experience. It's, it's the Definitely. best education. And, yes. it, and, it, and I think it gives you even more compassion um, for, 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 for other people's experiences because it's very different when you're there. It's very it different. Is. It is. is. And, and it's your society also too, because you were, you were born there and you were raised there as well. So it's very different being on the inside looking out. It's very different being on the outside looking in. And then I think it's very easy to have blinders on when you speak about things that you think are no longer important to people and you recognize, oh, absolutely not. When people say things like that to me, I'm like, oh, it's just a drop in the bucket. Are you kidding? Like Exactly. Mm. And you see... Um, um, with certain age, I calm down with certain issues. 
Yeah, really, because, you know, all these things that are coming up now, I mean, um, you know it yourself. We know what we went through just because we look different. That's one thing. But that other people recognize that you might have a harder background just because they didn't witness it. If, uh, a, group, if a group of white boys run around, they don't have a black person in their group, they don't know how it will feel unless they have one. And that makes the difference. So the friends I had, like um, so many times I'm on a train or even back in the day as a teenager, when I was running through Berlin, the police were asking me if I had drugs and that, I mean, it was not a big deal because, and I would like to clear that up too. I, I'm may, maybe one of the few artists, I never took drugs ever. Wow. I had no interest in that. I mean. I grew up in Berlin, so before I went on the scene, everybody was drugged up anyway, and what I saw, I didn't like. So, but just because I was not white, when they were raiding uh, discotheques or the streets, when I saw them coming to me, I already stood, I just stopped walking. I said, okay, here we go again. They were ask me, do you have a joint or do you have a pill or whatever? So th that was very embarrassing for the friends around me that were white. They didn't ask them. Mm. So that's where the conversation starts. But if they didn't know me, things like that wouldn't happen. They would never see that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these are just little things, you know? This, mm -hmm. is, this is nothing. I have no problem if the police is running around looking for drugs, I'm up for it because it might save somebody else's ass you know, mm -hmm. for not taking it, for not taking anything. Mm -hmm. So I don't want, I don't even want to go into the bigger things that happened, uh, you know, throughout the life. I mean, all these things, I mean, it didn't kill me. It shaped me. It made me really strong now. It made me really strong now. So somehow I sometimes think, okay, just to, you know, to sugarcoat it a little bit. It trained me. It trained me that I can have conversa conversations with people that are, I wouldn't say dumb, but they just don't have the tools to, to the knowledge of that. If you're in your own, you just know what you know. You just know what you know, you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And as having it, as, the compassion. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people, I mean, many of them, of course, most of my friends in Germany, because like 90% of all German people are white. <laughs> so many of the friends I have, uh, my best girlfriend is white. Uh, my, uh, my husband is white. My mother is white. Um, many friends are white and they all have, many of them have brown black international loved ones children whatever we're really very rainbowish <laughs> <laughs> so i don't have you know i have access enough to uh, enough of white people to know that not to feel feel like whenever i see white people oh danger coming you know mm -hmm. Because in different countries is different, I know that. I don't want to compare. I mean, you cannot compare America to Germany. I had a, a lot of very interesting conversations on that one, especially in New York. When I was in New York the first time and I saw every, it, it's really very, very, New York is colorful. But once you have black friends, you have white friends, you have Latino friends and a few years later, I just noticed, oh, they're not even connected. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Somehow, my black friends nearly, they are in Harlem, have other black friends that I met. So it was very natural for me, of course. Mm -hmm. The friends I have in Vegas, most of them are white, came over the business side from the hotels and all that. They have some black friends because they have black artists as friends, but in their private, I didn't see many black people. It's not something negative. I'm just observing. I'm just observing that. 
So I thought, okay, as colorful as New York is, everybody is doing their own thing. You know, even in the club scene. I was there with my husband many, many years back. So we went to a black club. He was the only white. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, you know, I, I just had to do that. I told him so. The first time, yeah, really, he was the only white guy. So I said, so just for these four hours, <laughs> you know, or you get a little, a little feeling yes. how that is. You yes. know what I mean? I've done it too. <laughs> yes. You did. Taste. You did. Oh yeah. oh yeah. I've had those experiences. And, and also too, like my mom is white. So she's had those experiences too, where it's like, you know, but like, yeah, like my sister, we've done it to her husband in a way, yeah, where, yeah, you know, yeah. he's the only white guy with exactly. everyone, everyone's black. And it's like, yeah. And they're like, yeah, wow. Interesting. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> little, yes. Little days, yeah. <laughs> Yes, and this little thing opens something in your brain, of course, if it's not already open, you know? Right, 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 right. So, but even at the same time, the, the, you're in a black club, the people that I don't know, they look at me because they want to see, oh, what kind of connection is that? Is he black? Is he Latino? He's with a white? What is he? Being in a white club, they would think, what is the white guy doing with this guy? <laughs> So to be to be honest, the place where I really felt free was a Latino club because everybody looks like everybody. Somehow, a little black, a little Latino, a little Chinese, a little of everything. And I didn't expect I didn't expect that. But um, as you said earlier, you will only know if you go there. You know, so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. I I wanted to ask you too, like because you've 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 you spent a lot of time in Thailand and yes, and you were my second there. home. Your second home. It's my second said. home. Yeah. And yes. how was your experiences in Thailand? And what do you love, obviously, about being a performer in Thailand and living in Thailand? I was in Thailand about two years ago. Um, okay. And I was just there, like, on a holiday. I was in Bangkok okay. for a little bit. I was in. I love Kent. Bangkok, and I live in Bangkok. And you live in Bangkok, so that's amazing. Yes. And um, yeah, yes. had I known, I would have, I would have called you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know now for the next time, please. Exactly, <laughs> I know for the future, and I, I will be, I will be calling you. I will. I, will I have a guest room. I have a guest room, so you are invited. Thank you so much. It'll, it'll, it'll You're just so welcome. be amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, how did you end up like spending so much time in Thailand, and then also to like mix in between that, like? You know, mm -hmm. you, I know you said that you left Thailand um, right when the pandemic started. And so you came yes, back to Berlin in March, so you've, you've, in March you spent um, this the entire pandemic uh, back in Germany. But yeah, how yes. did everything evolve in Thailand and what's it like for you um, in, in Thailand with the Thailand mm -hmm. entertainment scene? And um, I mean, like, I know, I know my experiences of it, but um, yeah. they're, not, they're not so many, um, but okay. I love Thailand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it basically it basically started as a vacation uh, with me and my back then he was my boyfriend. We're married now, oh. so it's really, really, really long time ago. Mm. So um, we Doesn't just it kept. Always? Yes, yes. <laughs> started off so as it, a vacation. <laughs> it started off as a vacation, um, meeting friends. Uh, Bangkok was like a complete shock at first because it was just too much in every aspect. But after I left, I knew, oh God, Bangkok is something else. Bangkok is something else. So we just kept returning. We got a home there in Bangkok, an apartment. So that gave very soon then, um, because I knew this is a place where I would like to spend the winter. I hate winter. Nobody should tell me otherwise. I hate winter. I hate the cold. I hate the lack of sunshine, everything that goes with it. No, thank you. Um, so usually I spend the winter in Thailand and I knew um, Bangkok is big enough. I could do shows in Bangkok. And now fast forward, Bangkok is like my second home. And I usually when I go to Bangkok, I work in Asia then, like I, I would fly over to Hong Kong to do business there or the surrounding countries, but based in Bangkok, like in Europe, I'm based in Berlin. And I try to do the same thing with, with, with Bangkok because Bangkok is really, Bangkok is it. 
if if there's something you're looking for if you don't find it in bangkok it doesn't exist on the whole entire planet that's what <laughs> i would say that's really that's my opinion that's my opinion in any shape so um having a home there makes you 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 have a different feeling you have a different fe feeling towards the country um and if i say that i'm going to thailand longer than 20 years now so i know the city i know the customs i know how bangkok looked before they had their 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 underground and their sky train and all that was in place at that time so i really see the place with their people and that has a lot to do with their with their art of religion i myself and i just have to clear that again i'm not religious let's say i was born into a very catholic family in nigeria not by choice you i mean you'll be born into that then you grow up and everybody talks about heaven and hell from morning to night something like that it's really extreme over there especially in the in the village so in thailand you have the buddhism and they are they have a very different approach and this is very important because religion is important to see um, the way they treat other people. I studied Christianity, I studied Islam, I studied so many things just, you know, just to gain knowledge, just to gain knowledge. The north of Nigeria is Islamic, the south is they're Christian. So I had no, no connection to the, to the Islamic north at that time when I was there. So the Buddhism, the Buddhism people, they have a different approach to life in general. And the way, if they, if they don't know something, they will not just assume it's bad because they don't know it or uh, because they don't like it. They still have respect. I think they have more respect to other religions than any other religion. Other religions always say, we are the best, we are number one. We accept the rest, we accept mm -hmm. the other ones, but we are number one. They don't do that. They I, don't do I, that. I firmly agree on that. Mm -hmm. you no. Know? Mm -hmm. So that's why when they see me, even if they don't know me, if they don't know me, I mean, even in Thailand, I blend in somehow because I've seen a lot of mixed, mixed people like black Thai. I could fit in there very easily. I have a light Chinese, I wouldn't say Chinese, Asian eyelid a little bit just without makeup i could be there could be some asian in there mm -hmm. so there was always a problem because they always assume i'm thai when i'm there if they don't if they don't see my curly hair if i have a cap on they just go on speak thai with me and say whoa 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 i don't understand if you speak that fast <laughs> <laughs> but the way they approach things they don't know the way they approach especially black people i i would really want to say black people you know, mm -hmm. it's a difference if you say, uh, how do you think about Italians or Chinese or whatever, black people. It's the only area where I don't have the feeling that they really have something negative to say. It has to do with their history as well. You know, of course they have a different history. They didn't capture any African people, brought them over to Thailand. They didn't have that kind of history and I did I just didn't want to say a specific word if you know what I mean so they know there are other cultures they know black people and just the way they approach you I'm, I, I know a lot of black people in Thailand the way you know when they just do their their daily routine like go to the grocery stores or take the tube and and drive to somewhere the people don't look at you with the frightened behind or have something negative what their parents told them they're just open to new things bottom line and i love that and that's why i really felt felt very um at home there immediately i mean i wouldn't go as far i mean uh, the the government doesn't really would never say oh we love gay people not that way but gay people in Thailand have a certain amount of protection mm -hmm. from the people. 
mm -hmm. because they, their religion doesn't say gay people are wrong mm -hmm. or trans people are wrong or you go to hell because they don't have, they don't have that heaven and hell thing they just respect the other human being and that's what i would like to see everywhere you know and that's like a shock because when i go to thailand i stay there like two and a half sometimes three months in a row so you just get you know you just get the flow you're at home uh, i don't have big bags when i go there i have everything already there so sometimes i work most of the time um, we just have like holiday we go to vietnam or we go to malaysia for a week these kind of things so once you leave thailand and come back to europe or you come back to or you go to america and you have a different reality just like boom you you just get out of the plane and there's oh god yeah there was something there was this uh <laughs> color thing and the and the gender thing and in thailand nobody gives a shit oh sorry i said it nobody cares you know yeah <laughs> they don't care it's like it's so it's so open it's yes so, it is it's so accepting i mean there's just an energy that you feel in certain places where you're like yes just everything about you is just okay it's it's definitely an an, an, an energy i i feel that when isn't I that to, nice yeah isn't that nice it's it's you such know? a relief and you can you can feel it on a visceral level and especially also too with with buddhism i actually i practiced um a form of buddhism uh several years ago it was the oh wow it was the yeah. buddhism made famous by tina turner and exactly i, I exactly. loved it i practiced it i practiced that nam myoho renge kyo for for, mm -hmm. for several years it was it was it was my version of singing um it was the closest oh, wow. <laughs> the closest that i could get to singing every single day and it was so powerful and so it had such a profound um uh, impact on my life when I was when I was younger. I, I practiced it like many, okay. many years ago. But yeah, I mean, wow. when you go into and this is the other thing which you're reminding people of too. It kind of when I tell people like, no, there are places and countries you can go into where you literally feel that difference. Like you feel that yes. shift. You do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the thing is, the thing is, of course, of course, it's somehow it's my responsibility in my own rights to help you know on this kind of subjects in my home where i am in berlin i'm not really in the in the forefront because i know there's a lot of wonderful people that can do that better i'm very emotional and i would get sick of certain things very quickly you know <laughs> so i'm not really the perfect person for that and let me just say it this way it's maybe even it's a little selfish to run to Thailand in a way, but still, I think I have the right, you know, mm -hmm. to have a place mm -hmm. where I can just forget about certain things for a while. Of course, of course. I mean, if you if and you're lucky enough to have access exactly, to, to, to exactly. a place on that level, I mean, absolutely. And, yes. you know, I wanted to ask you, how did... You know how did it impact you not being able to go to Thailand now? You haven't been able to go for this entire past oh, horrible. year. And horrible. How did, it's the yeah. first winter. It's my <laughs> first. I think in the last, uh, I I had two winters in Germany since I'm out of school. Oh dear. So that's the way I hate winter. Okay. <laughs> Before I met my now husband, then boyfriend. When I started work, working, I went, I was living and working on the Canary Islands where I worked over the winter. So I came out of school, immediately took a, took a, um, took a plane ticket, went to the Canaries, worked there over the winter and mm -hmm. spent the summertime in Berlin. Same. That's how I escaped <laughs> the winter since I'm a teenager. That's how I hate winter. <laughs> I spent so many winters in Europe, but once I figured it out, like, oh, you can try to take contracts where it's warm during winter. Exactly. Cue the Philippines. Cue China. Cue going, trying to find as much work in Asia as I possibly can. Cue exactly. the Caribbean. Cue cruise ships. Yes. <laughs> I was like, oh, right, okay. And then I will go everywhere right. else 
afterwards yes. and, and escape from there. So yes, I totally understand you. Um, how, how did everything impact your performing this past year? How has that felt to not be on stage again uh, during the pandemic? And then, you know, how are you feeling like looking towards the future? I mean, obviously dialing back into performing, but what has that kind of done for your soul over this past year? Obviously you didn't have access oh. to Thailand, which is like your home away from mm. home. Um, being in that very open, inclusive environment, which is has been, you know, I think a, a, a lot of people's experience too. They haven't been around their communities that they can run to. I think they're running to them virtually, but you know, that's also yes. that's a thing. That's the thing that keeps us sane. We all have our we all have our self care. We all have our 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 safe places, and what we found, you know, is like our default setting mm-hmm. during this piece. Um, so, you know, how is it? Felt? not expressing have you been doing virtual performances at all or no have you just no been, not at no, all nothing at all okay for me for me personally it was horrible it was really horrible on different levels um not not not, not the being here in the wind not being here in the winter thing i mean i was more or less forced out of thailand because i knew at that time something is really happening now. I mean, in Thailand, I remember the Tsars thing. A few years back, I was in Thailand just, and it happened in Thailand. It didn't come to Europe, but I remember with, with, with the mask and everything, everything was shut down. And I was in Thailand when that happened a few years back. So it was something very similar, but I knew this time something else is happening because people were talking. And if Thailand, they have a border to, to, to China, they already closed everything. So I knew, okay, if I choose to, it was tough because I knew I didn't, of course, I didn't know what's going to really happen, what happened. I thought it would take a while, maybe three, four months and then they will figure it out. But I thought, if not, you will be stuck in Thailand. And another thing, my medical system in Berlin is the best mm. in Germany. It's, I mean, it sounds stupid, but it is the best. I've seen many, I know people all over the place. I know how they come up with their insurances and everything. We are covered with, with everything. So yes. I knew if something happens in Thailand, that might be a big hustle, maybe. You know, get, get your insurance in Germany because of course my first home is, is in Germany. So my my um everything medication everything is centered in germany that might be a hustle so i had to leave thailand with the last plane and when we got to back to germany um (laughs) with the last plane over moscow where we got our connecting flight when we were in moscow already so i left bangkok without knowing if i would make it to germany what many people might not know, um, Russia is a closed country. You cannot, you cannot even access one part of the airport if you don't have a visa. No. You know? You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so being on the flight from Bangkok to Moscow, you were just thinking, oh, I don't, is this a movie? A very bad one, by the way. What is happening? with all these people that just came to Thailand on the same day when we were leaving, they were sent back immediately. They didn't even let them into Thailand. They had to all go back. That was the 18th of March. So that was already a horrifying return to Germany. We got our return flight. We came to Berlin. Nobody, um, the mask thing was was not in fashion here at that time, of course. I'm used to using masks in Thailand for so many years when, you know, alone because of the air pollution sometimes, you put on a mask. The radio tells you, the air is horrible today, please put on your mask if you have any conditions. So I'm a singer, I have to take care of my voice. I run around with a mask in Thailand. Nothing new for me. So when we came back to Germany on the 18th of March and I saw nothing is really happening here, the airport, they just put us in a, in, in a, they asked us, if you have a mask, put them on. Then you went into the bus so that you get to your terminal. While in Thailand, everything was already closed. I was used to 
already having, you know, a kind of a lockdown. And they were, they were preparing it here. So I was really afraid because I thought, oh, what are you waiting for, people? There's something really horrible already happening. Mm -hmm. I felt it in Thailand. Mm -hmm. And here you're just talking and talking. Mm -hmm. So, of course, while I was in Thailand, all my shows already started to get canceled, of course. That's why I thought, okay, I might stay there <laughs> because I'm not working anyway, you know? Yeah. Cruise ships, big things, um, small things, important things, and not always big things are important. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yes. So, oh, yes. <laughs> big things most of the time are for the bag. <laughs> and important things are for your artistry or for your brain. So everything just got canceled. And then I thought, okay, you're home. My mom is in Berlin. I would take care of her. She knows she's not going to leave her apartment. I mean, fast forward one year. I, I try to meet her. I think it's the only thing with the pandemic that I see my mother so much now that I couldn't do in the last years because I was never here. Me too. Me too. She can't you know? believe it. It's like, it's almost yes. overwhelming for her sometimes. She's like, I haven't seen you this exactly. much in your entire like adult exactly. life. <laughs> yeah. So everything really changed. So even before um, they announced we're going to close, I mean, for the record, in Berlin, we never ever till this day had a real lockdown. I mean, they use this word all the time. I see it in different places. We have some, you know, like a medium shutdown. So let's say grocery stores were never closed. The drug stores were never closed. So you always had access to, to everything, basically, basic things. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't as hard as like my friends in the UK that I know they were locked up in their homes for months. I, we didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So we were even on a luckier side. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because that's really frightening because I know older people, uh, I mean, older people sound stupid, but you know, like female singers that I work with in England, I know their homes, I've slept there. So I know how, how they live. They have a beautiful little house out, out in nowhere. And then they close everything. What do you do? How do you get your food if you're not allowed to leave your home and all this kind of thing? So I had this kind of this, uh, conversations with people I know. That made me scary. Not myself. Not myself, you know. Mm -hmm. But I saw around me, around me, everything was breaking apart. People that I know now, I know they will not be in service after the pandemic. Maybe hotels, maybe um, artists, or maybe maybe venues, many venues here in Berlin where I have access internal. I know they are really struggling and I know for sure if they have no business till April, they're done. Mm. And I don't see no theater in Berlin opening by April. So I'm not complaining for myself, although still, of course, it's hard. Many people ask, oh, how, how, how could you survive so or how do you survive so long? You know, we, we talk, we talk with people. Um, if you have no income, in the summertime, I, did, I think I did only one virtual, it wasn't really a virtual, Christopher Street Day, which was important. So that's why I did it. So we were um, on, a, on a TV set. It was just on a, in, in TV outside was very strange of course but that was not supposed to make any money so that was not the reason for that that was you know uh, the Christopher Street Day thing has to go on even in a uh, pandemic so I was happy that at least Berlin said of course we're canceling the big show but we have to do something so I did that one but a part of that I did in summer when we had a slight opening exactly two shows and that was it at all i did one in hamburg on a on a ship it was the first show <laughs> for the ship in the year in that year in august imagine the whole year no show and then in november everything was closed down <sighs> so i had like two or three shows so you can imagine that doesn't buy you enough bread for the whole year <laughs> <laughs> you see yeah. i my 
I'm not really flashy. I'm not living alone. Uh, uh, we are two. So, well, we we lived of our savings, you know. Yeah. Um, and still, I say I'm lucky. You know, I'm lucky because I know other people that are really. I, I wouldn't even say struggling, but to really use the word surviving. If I think about my family in Nigeria, that's again a completely different thing now. You know. Mm -hmm. When I speak with my father, I mean, it's so out of this universe that uh, when I call my dad, he's really old and he's in the village. I didn't even ask him. I didn't even need to ask him, um, do you have an appointment for a vaccine or something? Because that is so science fiction to ask him that. You know? Yeah. I'm, I'm struggling here uh, that my mom is going to get her first shot on the 10th of March and I'm furious as that she's old, she has to get it now. You know, complaining on one side, but I have the appointment for her. And my dad in Nigeria, different story. I can't even try to bring that subject up because it makes no sense in West Africa. <laughs> There's nothing like that discussion right now, you know? Mm -hmm, so it's mm -hmm. always a bitter pill while I am, you know, vexing about something that I think, oh, it cannot shut up, you know? I know it's, it's horrible. Everything is horrible right now. But there are other places, it's worse. It's really horrible. Yeah. And I'm emotionally, emotionally uh, attached to my family in Nigeria, and I cannot help them, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have... Uh, let's say I'm I'm somebody that could have made an impact in that Nigerian family before the pandemic, like on gay rights, which I call basic human rights. Yes, that's that's yes. the way I am going. You know, I'm just Me talking too. about human rights first yes. before we step any further, yes. because I am pre I have the privilege of not living there. And I'm saying it that because I can go there, open the conversation and put my behind back to Germany where I'm safe. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But I feel I have the duty. I have the duty mm. to show my, um, you know, the family members that are coming after me, my young cousins, the males and the, and the females. And I'm in contact with them that they should see that I am how I am, but I am as part of the family as they are. Yeah. And nobody there should get me wrong that to think that I feel less or no, 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 no. I'm really happy exactly the way I am, you know? Mm -hmm. And everything I, I have now, I owned it myself. I didn't really have much help, but it's no problem you learn if you don't have help. And you learn if you listen. Mm. You know, many people talk a lot, but while you talk, you don't learn. So except of doing an interview like this now, usually I prefer to listen than to talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I learn. <laughs> same, same. I, exactly. I, 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 I would give the same advice. That's such sage advice Ikenna that's so invaluable really it is and I, I I I agree and I I think the same there's so much that I have learned in this business and how to navigate yes. from listening and to 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 yeah to being just present to what people have to say about their experiences and learning from them so that's a really beautiful way to put it I I I wanted to thank you so much for sharing all of these experiences that you've had. Oh no, thank you're, you. You're thank so you. amazing. I, I wanted thank to you. ask you just one last question, just to leave a short, you know, just kind of projection into the future of, of yeah, what do you feel going into the future for like the arts and for yourself and what it'll feel like to get back on the stage again and perform again when you do like what do you feel that's going to like be like when things eventually begin begin again well um if i'm honest i don't really know i don't really know um how i will feel 
feel, but I know for sure it will not be like uh, we're going back to business. Mm -hmm. And one thing where I am lucky and I guess you are lucky too, as soon as we can be booked again, we have our talents with us. So we could just, you know, pick up somehow. Yes. Of course, I know there is, um, I'm a perfect, how do you say, uh, I like to have everything really precise. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as, like, let's say the swimming pools are open, I'll be, that's what I do for fitness. I do swimming, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was something that um, I missed this year a lot because all swimming pools are closed. That's where I can, you know, some people go jogging, which I can because of my knee. I tried that. Our, that's, uh, I went to, I, I go to swimming so that I can have some exercise for my lungs, for the singing, for the whole, you know, the whole body and soul. So that's where I feel there's something missing for me to have an outlet. We watch too much news. I try to reduce that now, although now it's too late. I watched the news too much last year. America was like, a, ooh, that was a movie. Mm, especially the last half. I'm not going into details because that's a big subject we should all avoid because you know what I mean. <laughs> so I'm only asking you about the art. That's why I'm, yes. <laughs> so I'm only yes. asking you about the you stage. Know? Exactly. And so like, uh, as soon as I, I think I'm positive to think that by summer, we might be working again, maybe not that big. Mm -hmm. We'll start with smaller things. I'm very sure about that. Mm -hmm. I'm very sure about that. Mm -hmm. Maybe not to that extent. Mm -hmm. So let's say the big things that are usually booked for the bag, for the money, I, I don't see myself being in an arena with 2,000 people kind of shows. Mm -hmm. Maybe like, you know, after All Night Long, I did a few concerts in Wintergarten on my own since then. Yes. You know, every year, like maybe two concerts, maybe a Ikena and Friends concert. So it was more than devastating to, because November was the one that we would have done to cancel that in advance, that was a horrible thing, especially when it's, you know, fully booked and all these people have to get their money back and all that drama. But I think we will get back. I don't know how it would look like, but for shows that really have employees, I don't have employees, I don't have big trucks and all that. I don't know how they will do that. And I'm really concerned about these people that are friends, of course, you know, and you, mm -hmm. you, you know the business, you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't make sense if they can book you, but they don't have the space or um, they don't have the theater <laughs> or they don't have the money to pay us. We will have to maybe assume we will, you know, get down with, we have to cut some paychecks as well. And if somebody can argue in a, in a, in a good way, honest way, I guess we will all ha have to help each other. You know, we all have to kick our asses as we always do. <laughs> yes, yes, we will. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't, um, like, I can't wait for you to get back onto the stage. You're so magnificent. You're so amazing. Thank you. Thank so you so much. much. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure. This has just been a stunning conversation, but I I knew that it would be. I mean, you're so magical. You're so radiant. Um, thank you so much for your wisdom and for your thank experiences. you, Shani. This was what <laughs> let me say it in a Whitney a quote. This is really one moment in time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is. It really is. <laughs> You, I mean, really of course, really and then you gave the best closing ever. I mean, you, you know, <laughs> my, uh, like, what am I going to do now? What, what do I say? <laughs> my heart is like all over the place. You are, <laughs> just, you are transcendent. You are so enchanting. You have such a brilliant, beautiful, poetic um, perspective 
of the world and you've lived so much and you are just you are a you are you're a sight to see you are a voracious artist in the, in the most oh, thank you beautiful so way meaning that you just you know you just radiate and you've catapulted yourself into so many different mediums um with who you are and thank you for being who you are thank you for never giving up on who you are thank you for being oh your no authentic self <laughs> thank Always. you for being brave. Thank you for your bravery. Yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, like again, that is that is that is that is your well, almost your first name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bravery Akena. Yes, it should be. Bravery Akena. Yes, yeah. bravery Akena. Thank you for being brave. Thank you for showing us the way, and thank you for telling us like how you became like who you are and how you've always always been who you are. I mean, I sometimes I tell and the kids, I love it. I, and know, I love it. You I, I and it shows and it and it feels like it. And I think yeah, you're just to me it's such a testament to bravery and again for anyone out there you know, when you're feeling like, you know, pushing boundaries or things are hard, it's like, remember, remember to be brave yeah. like a Kenna. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for reminding thank us you. all because we all know that we need a little bit of extra bravery during this time. And so thank you for we that. Need that. Thank you for that extra bravery to um, help to get us through and to help us get back to the stage again. So thank you again. Oh, bless you. Bless you, Shani. In honor of Black History Month, I wanted to dedicate this episode of the Live Like an Acrobat podcast to a trailblazer in the Black American community that has been mostly overlooked throughout the years. I discovered the epic contributions of Polly Murray some few years ago, actually. But most recently for this Black History Month, their story has been widely shared in mainstream media and news. Polly Murray lived one of the most remarkable lives of the 20th century. They were the first black person to earn a GSD or a doctor of the science of law degree from Yale Law School, a founder of the National Organization for Women, and they were the first black woman at that time to be ordained an Episcopal priest. Polly Murray's legal arguments and interpretation of the U.S. Constitution were winning strategies for public school desegregation, women's rights in the workplace, and an extension of rights to LGBTQ plus people based on Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Polly Murray crafted a broad vision of justice, equity, and human rights using words as their primary tool in the fight for liberation. Polly resisted categories of race, class, gender, and sexual orientation, wrestling with issues raised by their own racial identity, economic struggles, and sexual and gender identity. They aspired to an integrated body, mind, and spirit that aligned with a holistic sense of self. Murray was a trailblazing, black, non-binary, queer, feminist, poet, lawyer, legal scholar, and priest who influenced the likes of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Thurgood Marshall and is viewed as a hero to many in the trans rights movement. We honor Polly Murray on the Live Like an Acrobat podcast. And thank you so much for joining me for this episode where I interviewed the sensational Whitney Houston tribute artist, the Ikena Amici. Live Like an Acrobat podcast is also available on Circus Talk, the inclusive, independent, and international online network for the circus industry. Circus Talk's mission is to create a level playing field for this industry and democratize access to information. Please consider subscribing to the Live Like an Acrobat podcast and to the circuspreneurblog.com where you will find extended conversations and interactive content of each episode of the Live Like an Acrobat podcast. 
I'm your host, Shanae Stiletto, and until next time, please stay safe and stay healthy.